In exegesis, we follow the approach I've just outlined for you. It is the the grammatical, historical approach to the text. Every paragraph, one intended meaning, the meaning the author originally intended. And our goal in exegesis is to lead that meaning out. And that's what we've done right here. That's, That's been our purpose. So, so far then, in the process, we have observed, we have followed, I should say, two steps, preparation and observation. Now, don't get scared There are three steps left, but they're not nearly as intensive in time as those, the the second step was, all right? So don't be scared by that, but they are still very important, and I want to move today now to this third step of meditation. You know, in the, in the age we live, you're, most of you have computers sitting in front of you, and if you don't, you, you have several probably. There's an amazing amount of information available to us. It's incredible. I remember the first time I got a, a CD, and on that CD, there were a couple of books. It's like, wow, that's astounding. But as you know, today there's investigation into continually more condensed storage of information. There's even talk of molecular storage in which the entire contents of the Library of Congress could be stored in a space the size of a sugar cube. Wouldn't that be something? Carry around a little thing in your pocket that had the entire Library of Congress on it. As Christians, there is so much information available to us in this age. Think about what the average Christian, even the average pastor, 500 years ago had at his disposal compared to what you have at your disposal. But unfortunately, knowing does not equate always to practicing. Why aren't we doing what we know? What is it that takes us from knowledge only to practicing, from hearing to doing? Scripture identifies that bridge. I want you to turn to Joshua. It's a fascinating passage. It's one of the most familiar in Scripture. Joshua 1.8. As, as God charges Joshua, as he, as he begins uh, to take the mantle cast by Moses upon him, he says, this book of the law, at this point, the only revelation Joshua had was obviously the first five books, those uh, revealed to Moses. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. What does that mean? Well, there are a couple of possibilities. That could mean uh, that the law should influence your speech. That's very unlikely, okay? That's not a likely interpretation. It could be he's referring to, you need to teach the law to others. In context, that's not likely either. The third option is far more likely, and that is, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth is a reference to reading. In the ancient world, as you know, often reading was out loud. Now, you see that even with the Ethiopian eunuch and, and Philip in the New Testament story. So it's likely this reference to it shall not depart out of your mouth is a reference to reading. And then he says, verse 8, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. The Hebrew word translated so that means for this reason, in order that. It speaks of purpose or intent. So you have reading and you have doing in the same verse. How can we move from knowing the Bible to doing it? What is the bridge between knowing and doing? The bridge is here in verse 8. Do you see it? It's meditation. He says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. There's reading. But you shall meditate on it day and night. It's to be in your mind, you're to think about it, you're to ruminate over it, so that for this purpose, you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have spiritual success. So meditation then, men, is the biblical bridge between merely having a a basic understanding of the Scripture and having a life-changing understanding of the Scripture where it is incorporated into the life. Now, 
when you hear the word meditation, you think, typically, most Christians think, of, you know, some Eastern mystical form of meditation. You're sitting there with your legs crossed and your, your fingers looped and you're repeating some mantra. As you know, there's a vast difference between Eastern meditation and biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is the antithesis of Eastern mysticism. In the pagan understanding, meditation is emptying your mind. In the Christian understanding, meditation is filling your mind. In pagan meditation, the goal is not thinking. In Christian meditation, it is intentionally choosing to think deeply. The biblical practice of meditation is absolutely crucial to the process of being a Bible student. Whether you are simply feeding your own soul, whether you're an individual Christian trying to digest the scripture, or whether you're a pastor trying to understand a text for your own soul and then to be able to communicate it to others. It's absolutely crucial. Now, what I want to do in the time we have with meditation here is is really consider three issues relating to meditation. First of all, why? Secondly, what? What is it? And then thirdly, how exactly do we do this? So let's, let's break it down that way. First of all, why meditation is important. Why meditation is important. What is the value of this skill? Well, again, according to Joshua 1.8, meditation is the tool that helps us move from reading and study to putting God's Word into practice. The result, of course, is spiritual prosperity. God tells Joshua, then when you do the word, having, medita- having read it, having meditated on it, and therefore doing it, you will have success. In context, that means you'll live wisely. You, you will have the ability to live in a way that pleases God. Now, we're going to learn there's another benefit to meditation as well that's really crucial to our Bible study process. I'll get there. But one great benefit of meditation, according to Joshua 1.8, is putting the truth into practice in your life. Let me just say, okay, I need to say this. There is a temptation for us as pastors to become mere conduits of the truth. Uh, The way I think of it is this. We become like hypodermic needles. We deliver the medicine to God's people, but we ourselves are unaffected by it. The only way to to keep from that, I believe in my heart of hearts, and I think I can show you, is through meditation. If all you do is study like we've already gone through, if all you do is observation, you make a decision about the text, you put a message together, you get up and preach it, the people of God will be helped. But you may not be. And you will miss understanding that text as the Spirit wants you to understand it, and you will certainly not be putting it into practice. I can tell you that from experience. Those times in my, my life, those weeks when, because of the crush of duties or whatever, I have neglected or lessened the time I've spent in meditation, the Scripture has not impacted me in the same way as when I do. That's just the truth. Look at Psalm 1 for a moment. I love this text. A few years ago, I preached on it at Shepherd's Conference. I think it's, obviously, it's the entrance to the Psalter. It's put here as sort of a gatekeeper for the Psalter. And it lays out, Psalm 1 does, the two ways. The way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. In Psalm 1, the way of the righteous is laid out in the first three verses. Here he defines as well what spiritual prosperity is and how one gets there. Notice he begins, how blessed. Uh, There are two Hebrew words, primary words for blessed. One of them has to do with God blessing, God actively initiating his blessing into a life. If I remember right, it's barach. Um, The other is the one used here. It's esherei. This is a word that doesn't talk about God doing something. Instead, it's a word where a third party is looking into the life of someone else 
and makes this observation. It could be translated, oh, to be envied. How enviable is that guy? That's the idea. God doesn't do anything here. This is a person, this is a, a third party looking into the life of someone else and saying, wow, I wish I, wish I were like that. Oh, to be envied is the man. Now notice um, Psalm 1 begins by, by describing this enviable person with three negatives. What the righteous does not do. He does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not stand in the path of sinners. He does not sit in the seat of scoffers. I, I wish I had time to really lay this out. If you're curious, you can go back and listen to my message online from Shepherd's Conference on this text. But, but let me just summarize it for you. What he's saying in those, in those expressions in verse 1 is that the righteous man actively rejects all human ways. And then in verse 2, he completes the description of the righteous man by what he does. And he says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. One attitude, think about this for a moment. The psalmist describes the righteous man. He's introducing the righteous. If, if I said to you, okay, I want you to describe the righteous. I want you to describe a righteous man. What would you say? Chances are you wouldn't say what he says here. In the gate to the Psalter, because he defines the righteous man in one attitude and one activity. First of all, he says he delights. He takes pleasure in. Ten times in the Old Testament, this Hebrew word is translated desire. He desires, but, but the idea is he truly takes his pleasure in in the law of the Lord. Obviously a reference to the scripture as it existed at that point, and for us, all of scripture. And he meditates in the law day and night. The psalmist is content, the psalmist is content to develop this one theme about the righteous. Compare that to what we would have done if we were defining the righteous person. And it's all about his response and relationship to Scripture. The righteous man is defined by rejecting all human ways and completely and thoroughly embracing God's way, the revelation of God. And he delights in it. He, finds his, he takes pleasure in it. It's his joy. Let me just stop here and, and preach at you a bit. Guys, it's really easy to do what you do with the Scripture either academically when you're in seminary or as a career when you're out of seminary. The question is, do you delight in this book? Do you take pleasure in it? That's the righteous person. And he meditates. Called to think deeply about God's revealed word, it's for every Christian. This is every be true believer. But it's also true for us who are going to be seminary professors, pastors. Now in verse 3, the psalmist shows us exactly what this, what this man who is Esherah. By the way, Esherah, the word blessed there, is a person who enjoys this sort of objective state of well-being in every area of life. And verse 3 describes it. Notice what this looks like. Here's what this, this state, this objective state of of being an enviable person is like. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Here's the psalmist's point. The enviable man in Psalm 1 enjoys a remarkable state of spiritual well-being accompanied by joy and satisfaction. He's filled with strong spiritual life. He's planted by streams of water. He's carefully cared for by God, literally transplanted by irrigation canals. He fulfills the purpose for which he was made. He yields his fruit in its season. He provides lasting benefit to those around him. And his leaf doesn't wither. He has permanence, endurance, and stability, whatever's going on around him. 
His soul prospers and thrives regardless of his external circumstances. That's what meditation promises, guys. It's crucial. So that brings us then to to say that meditation is a practice that is foundational to every Christian's spiritual health and growth. And I would add, it is also foundational to the understanding of Scripture you and I want to arrive at as students. So let's go on then to consider what meditation is. What exactly is the skill that promises so much? Before we define it, I'm going to give you a definition, but before we get there, I think what will help us come to that definition is to look at the three biblical words, the three primary Hebrew words that are used for this skill, and then to look at the primary benefits or primary results of meditation. I think when we put that together, we can come up with a definition. So let's first of all look at the biblical words. There are primarily three Hebrew words used of the skill of meditation. As a kind of reference point, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 143. Psalm 143. I'm not going to exegete, I'm going to break my own rule here. I'm not going to exegete this text in its context. I just want it to use it as a kind of a peg because what's unique about this verse is all three of the primary Hebrew words for meditate occur in this one verse. Okay? So look at Psalm 143, verse 5. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all of your doings. I muse on the work of your hands. Now, the, the, words, the Hebrew words translated remember, meditate, and muse are our three primary words that in various places are translated as meditate throughout the Old Testament. So this can just kind of be a, a hinge for us. Now, let's look at each of those words. First of all, the word remember. The Hebrew word remember Uh, is a word that usually doesn't refer to suddenly recalling something. You know, we use the English word remember. We we use it kind of like, oh, now I remember where I put my keys. In other words, it was out of my mind. I forgot. I couldn't bring it up. And then it came back to my mind. But that's not the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word implies deliberately reminiscing and thinking about something. It implies choosing what you think about. It's more like the way we use the word remember when you're sitting around the table with your family and friends or your family and you say to them, remember the great time we had last year on vacation? It's not that you forgot it. You hadn't. But you are now deliberately choosing to bring that to mind. That's the idea behind this Hebrew word. The second word, meditate, is a word that, that can mean to mutter, uh, kind of talk lowly under your breath, to whisper. But it often means to reflect or to think. It's a, it, it describes a kind of internal discussion. Think of it as kind of talking to yourself. That's sort of the, the idea behind this word. It's the kind of thinking that may originally have been accompanied by a low murmur. That's why sometimes this word is even translated to murmur. So, you know, maybe initially you're thinking, and I don't know, maybe you never do this, but I'm sure if you were to sort of have a camera in my study, there'd be times when I'm thinking and I have no idea that my lips are moving or that any sound is coming out, but, but I'm really thinking, but somehow it's still coming out of my lips as well. That's the idea here behind this word. In its most basic sense, though, it refers to what happens inside. For example, this word is used in Psalm 149 verse, or excuse me, Psalm 49 verse 3, the meditation of my heart. Obviously, the Hebrew word for heart has to do with the internal being often, and and certainly in that context. And so the meditation of my heart, the totality of my inner or immaterial nature versus in that same passage, the words of my mouth. The meditation of my heart versus the words of my mouth. So it's talking about what's going on inside. So the emphasis on this word is a kind of internal discussion. The third word in verse 5 of Psalm 143 is muse. This Hebrew word is usually translated to talk or to meditate. 
It means to go over a matter in one's mind. Deeply reflecting on a matter in one's mind, hence muse. It can be expressed out loud. Several times in the Psalms, it, it's translated to talk, um, to talk to oneself is the idea. Or it can happen only in the mind. There's several references in Psalm 119 where this word is used, where clearly nothing's coming out of the mouth. It's just something going on inside. So meditation then, what I want you to see when you put these three words together, meditation involves a determined choice to recall something to mind, an internal discussion, and deep intentional reflection on something. But what exactly is all of this, this concentrated thinking trying to accomplish? We get another clue into what meditation is before we actually define it by looking at its results. We've seen the biblical words. Let's look at the results, the primary results of meditation. There are two of them. First of all, meditation produces insight. Look at Psalm 119. Told you I'm going through this psalm, my own personal study. Psalm 119, verse 99. He says, I have more insight than all my teachers. You probably have people in seminary who take that as their like life's verse. Insight in this verse is the ability to know how to use the knowledge you've accumulated. This isn't merely academic knowledge. The Hebrew word for insight means literally prudence or shrewdness. It's not talking about the gathering of data. It's talking about the ability to use the knowledge that you have. Um, it's a person who knows the ropes. They, they have the knowledge and they have the capacity to understand how to use that knowledge in a meaningful way. They have insight. Now, the psalmist says, I have more insight than all my teachers. Did, is that because the psalmist read or studied or had more experience than his teachers? No. How did he get this insight? Look at the second half of the verse. It explains. For because your statutes are my meditation... I have more insight than my teachers because your statutes are my meditation. Now, how does that work? How does meditation bring that kind of insight? What's the theological answer to that question? How does meditation bring a deeper insight into Scripture? The theological answer is the Holy Spirit's illumination. The Holy Spirit's illumination. J.I. Packer gives what I think is the best explanation of illumination. He writes this, It is not a giving of new revelation, but a work within us that enables us to grasp, listen to this now, meditation, or illumination rather, is a work within us that enables us, one, to grasp, and two, to love the revelation that is there before us in the biblical text as heard and read and as explained by teachers and writers. Illumination is thus the applying of God's revealed truth to our hearts so that we grasp as reality for ourselves what the sacred text sets forth. It's not merely a mental cognitive awareness of the relationship of the words and the grammar. Unbelievers can get there. Illumination is beyond that. It's when we grasp as reality for ourselves in a life-changing way the truth that's laid out in the Scripture. That is the fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit, illumination. We'll look at some references in just a moment. Let me give you an illustration of it. What's illumination like? Well, Think of this. Imagine walking, going over to Europe. Maybe you're, you're visiting Europe uh, with your family or you're, you're on a study tour or whatever. You're in Europe. You walk into one of those magnificent great cathedrals. Unfortunately, dead spiritually, but a beautiful edifice. Wonderful, beautiful building. You walk in at night and you start looking around at all of the stained glass windows. Now, can you, can you see the colors that are in the stained glass window at night? Sure. 
Can you see the story that's represented in those stained glass windows at night? Absolutely. But imagine going back the next day when the sun has come up and is streaming through one of those stained glass windows. You walk into the cathedral and in the full light of the sun as it streams through that window, it literally comes alive. It becomes real and beautiful and attractive. You see it the way the original designer intended you to see it with all of the nuances that are there. That's what the Spirit does in illumination. He turns on the light behind the page. God's Word suddenly becomes real and beautiful and attractive and desirable. We get it. And we get it in a life-changing way that, that never leaves us. And we do it. We love it. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings that illumination, that insight. That, by the way, is why we pray for illumination. For example, Psalm 119, verse 18, Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Spirit, teach me. Illumine my understanding. When's the last time you sat down to study, to prepare a message, and you said, Holy Spirit, illumine my understanding. Ephesians 1.18, I pray, Paul says, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened the eyes of your heart, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Again, had he explained these truths to the, to the church in Ephesus? Of course he had. But he's praying for more than that. He's praying that the Holy Spirit would grant them true illumination, that they'd really, really get it in a life-changing, compelling way. Robert Raymond defines illumination this way. He says, the Holy Spirit's enabling of Christians generally to understand, to recall to mind, and to apply the scriptures that they've studied. To understand, to recall to mind, and to apply the scriptures they've studied. That's illumination. So through the work of the Spirit, meditation brings insight into the meaning of scripture. Now, let me just stop here and say, guys, this is what, why meditation is such an important part of sermon preparation. Because you can't help others get what you haven't gotten. The insight that comes only through meditation, that's what the scripture says, through the work of the Spirit granting you illumination as you engage in meditation, you're not going to get the full, the full depth, the full richness of that text. The second primary result of meditation, before we complete our definition of the word, not only does, does meditation grant insight, but it also results in application of the truth. Uh, again, back to Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. There's reading, but you shall meditate on it day and night. There is choosing deeply to think about it, to recall it to mind, to gain insight into it, so that for this purpose, you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Meditation is not only to gain deeper insight into the truth, it's also to think about it in order to consider how to apply it. In fact, this is an interesting observation, I think. In Psalm 1-2, we have the word meditate. The exact same Hebrew word occurs in Psalm 2-1. In Psalm 1-2, it's translated meditates. In Psalm 2-1, it's translated devises. You see the relationship to application? That the wicked are thinking to create a plan. And that's what meditation does as well. It's thinking about the truth in order to create a plan to carry it out. So meditation not only brings understanding, it also creates a plan of action to do what we've come to understand. That happens in the process of meditation. 
So now that we understand the Hebrew words and now that we understand the primary results, let's put together a biblical definition of meditation. Biblical meditation is deliberately choosing to think deeply about something, a passage or a truth, in order, one, to better understand it, and two, to plan how to do it. That's meditation. When I leave my study and grab a bite of lunch and then go for a walk at some point early afternoon, that's what I'm doing. And that's, I have that definition in my mind. I want to choose to think deeply about everything I learned in that passage that morning for two reasons. To gain insight, and I pray, Spirit, in, illumina- in meditation, grant me illumination. Help me to understand. As I think about this text, help me to understand it the way you intended it to be understood. And as I'm walking, I'm thinking, forget my people for a moment. Forget this message what did the Spirit intend for me to do with this text? How, what was the original authorial application? And, and I'm applying that to myself. What changes do I need to make? What, what thinking in my life needs to change? What, what perspectives need to be affected as a result of this text I've just studied? So I'm not thinking sermon preparation at this point. I'm thinking, I want to know what God said in this passage. I want insight and I want to do what God said in this passage. Meditation is first and foremost about me and my relationship to God through this text I've studied. And of course, that will bear fruit because some of the same things, the insight I gain, I'm going to share with my people. The application, if if it's how it applies to me, guess what? That's going to be some of the application I'm going to make with my congregation as well. Yes, sir. Meditation time, are you, I mean, you got pad and pencil where a thought comes, oh, I need to write that down just so I don't forget. Are you doing any of that? Yes, but not pad and pencil. I'm walking, so I have my phone with me when I'm walking, and I open notes and just dictate it in, you know. Yeah, I just, if, if it's something, yeah, exactly. If it's something that I, if it's something that I, you know, think is really important that I may forget, it's an insight. It's like, wow, I didn't see that in the study. I didn't make that note anywhere in my notes. I don't want to forget that. Then, yeah, I'll just break out my phone, hit the, hit the notes, hit record, and, and dictate it real quickly, and put my phone back in my pocket and keep walking. Yeah, it's not uncommon for that to happen. Okay, any other questions about that? All right. So that's biblical meditation. Now, let me give you an illustration. I love, I'm, I'm kind of eclectic in a lot of ways. I not only have an eclectic taste in music, I have eclectic taste in what I drink. I love, I have in my office uh, loose leaf tea and make loose leaf tea. I also have a coffee machine and love coffee. So I like the whole deal. Let's think about meditation as a cup of tea. For the sake of illustration, imagine for a moment that you are the hot water. The tea bag is God's word. Reading and studying the passage is like dipping that tea bag into the water, leaving it for a short time and pulling it out. You're studying, boom, in, out. It's into your mind. You're gaining some additional knowledge. What happens to that hot water when you're doing this? It begins to be tinged a little bit. Would you want to drink it at that point? No. Meditation is leaving the tea bag into steep. That's really what you're doing. You're you're digesting the truth that you've been interacting with all morning. You're, you're deliberately choosing to think deeply about it in order that you can better understand it and you can determine what to do about it. When we meditate on Scripture, we talk to ourselves about it. We turn it over in our minds, its meaning, its implications, its application to our own lives. It's talking to yourself about the scripture that you've been studying. Now, we spent most of our time on this skill in the Old Testament, but I just want you to know that it's not isolated to the Old Testament. Meditation is also present in the New Testament. New Testament is full of language of thinking deeply about God and his word. John 15, 17, if you abide in me, Jesus says, and my words remain in you, they abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is, this is 
the New Testament language parallel to meditation. I've already noted several references in the New Testament. Of course, Ephesians 1, I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be open, that you gain this insight. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from praying for them, and that means the Holy Spirit has to produce this. But when and how does it happen? It happens through meditating on the Scripture. Colossians, look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Again, very familiar text. Let, allow the word of Christ to richly dwell within you. As you know, that is the parallel to being filled by the Spirit. That's why I told you yesterday, I don't think it means you're like, you're like to be filled by the Spirit like you're a, you're a cup and the Holy Spirit is poured into you more. No, it's you're filled by the Spirit with the Word. The Spirit is the one doing the filling, not the one filling. He's filling you with a deeper understanding of the Word. That's the parallel passage here. Allowing the, the, the Word to, to fill you your mind and heart. Uh, Other texts as well. Now, what are supposed to be the objects of meditation? The objects of meditation, biblically, there are three of them. You know them, but let me just remind you. God's Word, obviously. That's what we're talking about. That is the, the primary focus of meditation throughout the Scripture. But there are two secondary focuses, and Foci, I guess, and I don't want to. I don't want to ignore them. One of them is God's works. Um, on your wonderful works, Psalm one forty five five says, "I will meditate." In context, probably the works of redemption, possibly the works of creation. But God's works, and in addition to that, Scripture talks about meditating on God's character. Psalm 63, 6, I will meditate on you. Now, where do we get the information to meditate on God? Obviously from his word, but this leads us in a slightly different direction. Psalm 145, 5, on the glorious splendor of your majesty, I will meditate. So uh, don't lose sight of any of these, but obviously the focus of our class and what we're talking about in preparation is the the focus on the Word of God. But of course, as you're studying the text, what are you going to find? You're going to find the works of God in that text, and you're going to find the character of God in that text. And so it really isn't like you choose one category and ignore the others. It's like if you're you're meditating on the Word, ultimately you're going to be meditating on the works of God and the character of God as well. So now that we know what meditation is, and we know that it's important raises the really important question of of how exactly do we carry this out? How meditation works. Now, let me just make sure you got this. First, you have to understand, you have to discover what the passage says. In other words, you've got to complete observation. You've got to do those steps we've already talked about. You must read and study the passage. Thomas Watson, in talking about meditation, made this point, the English Puritan. He said, meditation without study, this isn't a direct quote, but this is the essence of what he said. Meditation without study is dangerous. Meditation without study is dangerous. Why? Because you're just spinning this off the top of your head. You don't know what that text says. On the other hand, he said, study without meditation is presumptuous and will be fruitless because you're relying on your own, you're depending on yourself as though you have it in and of yourself to grapple with the profound eternal truth of God. So it's not either or, it's both and. Now, let me give you some specific methods. This is not an exhaustive list, okay? It's not an inspired list, and it's not original with me. Um, I have adapted some of these methods from Um, Donald Whitney's little book, Spiritual Disciplines of the Christian Life. But they're not original with him either. He borrowed those from Christians through the past in terms of how they've tried it. It's just a short list of how saints have tried through the centuries to focus their mind on thinking about the Scripture in, in meditation. So I just challenge you to deliberately, 
deliberately set aside time in your preparation for meditation. For me, the best way to do that is a walk. Because if I'm sitting in my office, I'm distracted by things around me. But if I'm on a walk, my mind is engaged with that text. I can force my mind to be there. And uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. Maybe it's during your study time. Maybe it's on a walk. Maybe it's in your commute. Whatever specific time works for you and your own personality and, and, and bent. But let me challenge you to do it intentionally. It's not going to happen accidentally. Okay, this is, this is not something that you can say, yeah, I need to do that. I'll try to remember. Not going to happen. You have to do it intentionally. You have to build it in. You must deliberately choose to think about the passage you're studying with two goals in mind, deeper understanding and personal application. Now, what are the methods of meditation? I'm going to show you, and and I thought about doing this with a a passage of Romans, and maybe I should have done that. I'm just going to walk you through a simple proverb, you know, one of the proverbs and sort of unfold what this looks like, because the key thing here is the methodology. So let's take Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Obviously self-contained. You get the, you get the basic idea. We, we, let's assume we've studied this text. You can look at it and get a pretty good idea of what's going on. But let me show you how meditation works. Number, uh, method number one, ask important questions of the, te- of the passage. You've already done this in observation, but you're, you're taking a little different approach. For example, ask yourself, how does this passage fit into the great theme of the Bible and the gospel? How does this passage relate to God is redeeming a people for his son, by his son, to his own glory? You tell me, how does that proverb tie back to the great theme of the Bible? It ties back in two ways, doesn't it? Uh, On the one hand, it reminds us of our need for the gospel because we do speak harshly. We do violate the relationships that we have with people. That happens, unfortunately, happens often. So it shows us our need for the gospel and how far we've strayed from the divine pattern. This, by the way, isn't Christocentric interpretation. This is just legitimately relating this text to the larger message of the Bible. In addition, this this text shows us how we can live with new hearts that have been given to us by God's grace. This is God's expectation for how his people will respond to one another, and he's given them the power to do so. So you're asking yourself, how does this passage I'm meditating on fit into the great theme of the Bible? What is the relationship of this passage to Christ? Again, I'm going to deal with, when we get to interpretation in just a few minutes, we're going to deal with Christocentric interpretation. I abhor it, okay? And you should too. But it's still legitimate to say, what is the relationship of this passage to Christ? Does it show our sin and need of Christ? Does it show his work for us? Does it reveal something about his person? Does it describe the way he lived as our example? And often those imperatives do. Because remember, he obeyed God perfectly. He's the only one who did all of these things that we're commanded to do. Thirdly, what does this passage uh, tell me that should be explicitly or implicitly about God? What about a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger? Anything there about God? To tell us anything about God? Not on the surface, okay? Nothing obvious. So you move on. How, does, how did the author expect the original readers to respond to this passage? Again, authorial application. Commands to obey, sins to confess and forsake, errors to avoid, emotions to be felt, promises to believe. For example, what's the scenario here in Proverbs 15.1? An answer turns away wrath. What is he implying has happened? Well, something has happened, obviously, in my relationship with another person. Implied here is that I caused it. It has made someone else very angry. The angry person is confronting me. 
And the command to me is, I must choose to respond to them in this way. You see all that? I mean, those are just, I'm just asking these questions, thinking through this text. Secondly, make general observations about the text. Again, you did this, but you're rehearsing it freshly in your meditation. What are some observations I can make about Proverbs 15.1? Well, what I say deeply affects others. I'm able to reach inside a person and either turn away or stir up anger in them. Another observation is there's both good and bad communication. A third is how I say what I say is important. Gentle has to do with manner and not just content. Particular words that I choose can hurt others. A harsh word, literally a word that causes pain. There's a big difference between saying, you know, honey, we're going to have to work a little harder to keep our, our home organized and saying you're lazy. Okay, there are words that cause pain. Disagreements can be resolved. Anger here can be turned away. Disagreements improperly handled can escalate into settled conflict. Stirs up implies escalating conflict. Those are just observations we can make from this one text. Those are just a few of them. Repeat it in different ways. Here's another great meditation tool. Just say it differently. A gentle answer turns away wrath. A gentle answer turns away wrath. A gentle answer turns away wrath. And a gentle answer turns away wrath. Now, you're not just mindlessly repeating it. You're, it's like picture it as turning, the, turning a jewel to see its different facets, to understand that next word in the context of the overall statement. This is very helpful. I use this often. Number four, write it out in your own words. This is really helpful. Or, or just in your mind as you're walking, like I do, think it through in your own words. If I were saying this in my own words, how would I say it? Here's how I wrote it out. A meek and gracious response to someone who is angry with me calms them. But responding in kind with anger and attacks will make them even matter. It just It helps you think it through. Number five, pray through the text. Take that text and what you know of it, express it back in a prayer to God. Here's, I wrote one down, just giving you an example. Lord, you've commanded me to love others as I love myself. But I confess that much too often my tongue becomes an instrument of pain, hurt, and discouragement for my family, my friends, and sometimes even people I don't know. Lord, forgive me and help me to pursue your way in how I speak to others. Help me to be gentle and gracious in what I say and how I say it. Give me the self-control your spirit brings to respond in love even when someone is angry and strikes out at me. Let my gentle response bring peace and calm and ultimately resolution to all such conflicts. Lord, don't let me give in to the flesh and strike out in anger purposefully choosing words that maim and bring deep pain. Instead, let me bring healing, comfort, and encouragement in what I say to others. I want most of all to be a peacemaker, for then, according to our Lord, I will both be happy and be a son of God. Okay? Pray it. Pray it back to God. And the final methodology I would suggest to you is think through specific ways to apply these truths to your circumstances. What do you think might be the primary way you could apply Proverbs 15.1 in your life? Like your spouse, if you're married, that would be your roommate, if you're not. Okay, it starts really close. How can I practice this? When my wife is angry at me for something either I have done or she thinks I have done, how should I respond? Well, I, I, need, to, I may, need to make sure I don't respond in kind. I must not choose specific words intended to hurt her because she's hurt me 
You see what I'm saying? You're, you're thinking through, how can I apply this in real life? Guys, I can't overemphasize the importance of the skill, both to your Christian life and to your preparation. It was meditation that gave birth to the Protestant Reformation. Listen to Martin Luther. This is, um, I'm quoting this from Piper's book, Legacy of Sovereign Joy. This is what Luther wrote. He said, I had indeed been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul in the epistle to the Romans. Okay, he was really struggling, wanted to understand. And he says, you know, the phrase, the righteousness of God had stood in my way. Nevertheless, here it is. I beat importunately upon Paul at that place, most ardently desiring to know what St. Paul wanted. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words. There I began to understand. Meditation, thinking about the scripture, is what God used to actually draw Luther to himself, to bring the gospel to bear on his soul, and to initiate the Protestant Reformation. It wasn't just study. It required study, but it wasn't just study. It was meditation. All right. Any questions about meditation? <coughs> Again, I, I know as you sit here, you're thinking, you know, well, this, give me some more tools to help me in my preparation. Guys, okay, this is what the Bible says. This is what God says. This is how the Spirit works. So don't think you can shortchange this.